Welcome to the Alternatives Mason podcast with host Brittany Mason, Chief of Staff at Bonnery and Capital Management. You'll learn how to build alternatives knowledge brick by brick. Bonnery and Capital Management uses technology to help independent advisors scale and educate themselves on alternative investments. And since education is such a big piece of what we do, we are excited to kick off the series to dive into the nits and grits of the alternative space. Hello everyone, my name is Brittany Mason and I am Chief of Staff here at Banner and Capital Management. Welcome to Episode 3 of The Alternatives Mason, where we are building alt knowledge brick by brick. On this episode, please welcome our very special guest, Dave Thornton, our co-founder, the CEO, and Chief Investment Officer at Vested. For the past 12 years, Dave has been a serial entrepreneur. His most notable accomplishments include the founding and successful sale of Patient Finder and his collaboration with Emilio Sejo, a principal quantitative strategist at Vested, in the creation of a real-time illiquid asset pricing model. Dave also has spent time building the systems at a hedge fund within Citigroup and worked as a program manager at Microsoft. I also understand you went to law school, Dave. That's so exciting. That's awesome. So, you know, thank you so much for taking the time out of your busy schedule to join us here to talk about the alternative space. I am very glad to be here and thank you for having me. Thank you. I'm really excited to learn more about what you're doing over at Vested. I, I understand that you guys have really carved out a very unique uh, approach when it comes to VCs and making VCs, you know, more accessible. So I would love to start with that. Let's learn a little bit more about what you're doing there. Yeah, happy to. Um, let me first back up and give you background on Vested, the company. Our trajectory was not always uh, to be an asset manager making a VC product uh, that is accessible for more investors. So it's kind of important to understand where we came from. Uh, Vested originally was created to help startup employees understand their equity in the first place. Most startup employees are pretty heavily compensated in stock options. They are pretty heavily undercompensated in cash because most young companies don't have cash. Uh, and most of them make bad decisions as it relates to their stock options, as those stock options mature, and especially as they end up leaving companies and are almost forced to uh, do something with those stock options. So. The first version of Vested was just a website, and the website had free content such as articles on the difference between stock and stock options, articles on key stock option terms like early exercise, uh, and also free tools such as uh, an equity grant fairness calculator or an outcome simulator. Um, out of the first year, year and a half uh, worth of user base that we built on that website uh, with the free content and the free tools, we started to have startup employees come to us looking for money, uh, which was interesting because we were very clearly and explicitly not in the capital providing uh, uh, role. So uh, when we looked into it, we saw that uh, the folks that were coming to us for money were coming almost entirely to find funding for their stock option exercise, uh, typically after they had left a company and encountered for the first time the dreaded 90-day post-termination exercise window, which is you get stock options at a startup, you leave, and you find out that you've got 90 days within which you must exercise or else all of your equity disappears. So all of the asset management work that we're doing right now came from that basic need. There was a, there's, there's a market for what I just described, stock options funding, but um, for the most part at the time that we were looking at this, it only really served senior employees and founders of very late stage private companies. And it was the everyone else bucket that was ignored. And so we built a, almost like an index-like fund strategy around helping everybody else, where we're, we, we decided we would help employee by employee, sector by sector, leaving companies and stage by stage uh, in little small bites and build up a hugely diversified, very unconcentrated portfolio of exposure to um, venture-backed common stock. And that is the product that we kind of productionized and have brought to market. And it's it's been pretty interesting because we didn't really understand that there was a deep need for this. We were solving a problem for our employees as we built this fund product. 
And then we started learning about who our investors were or should be. And we saw that there was a huge set of investors that were kind of locked out of VC, but that have been wanting to be in VC for the last few years, at least. Um, one set was uh, folks that weren't ready or didn't have like $10 million to give to a brand name VC, either because they didn't have it or because that's just a significant portion of their overall asset allocation and it wouldn't have made sense. The other set was uh, the group in, of investors that even if they did have the capital to do that, they were not comfortable with single fund manager, single vintage risk. And so taking all that money and putting it uh, like on one number on the roulette wheel one time was not an appropriate thing for them. And so the VC index at a discount strategy actually really resonated with a lot of people that were looking to get into the asset class. And so that's kind of the backstory for how we ended up creating our current fund product and who it's mostly meant to serve. Okay. And now is that the the product, the two for, for RIAs? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, the the fund price. So it's not so much that it's uh, for RIAs, although there's a, there's a whole thread to pull there. Um, it's mostly for their clients, the the high net worths who wanted to get into VC and haven't been able to, uh, and then for a variety of reasons, the folks managing their money, who are the RIAs, have not been able to get them in. Um, it has an interesting value prop for RIAs specifically, which is. Uh, in addition to being an interesting product to get their current clients into VC, uh, it's also a product that is built by helping startup employees own private shares. And when those startup employees have their liquidity events, they will typically pay the fund and they will have their first million dollars and they will need wealth management. So it's kind of like a nice full circle relationship with the RIA universe. Oh, that's nice. And so... I see that you're also managing real risk in the VC asset class, uh, you know, during these these uh, crazy times. Can you tell me more about, about that? Sure. So, yeah, it, it's, a, it's a very easy trade to put on in a flat market. It's a, a slightly different trade, at least from a risk management perspective, in the type of market that we live in right now. Um, it's a little bit uh, tongue-in-cheek to call it something index-like because uh, number one, we're not putting in one unit into every company and therefore it is explicitly not an index. But number two, we're not waving in every deal that walks in the door. Uh, we're actually doing quite a bit of selection on the companies and we still have a substantially broader remit than any of the other folks that are participating in the VC asset class, at least as far as I'm aware. So like there are a few thousand companies out of the 30,000 US headquartered venture back companies uh, that we like, which is like 10 times bigger than the next biggest remit. Uh, but it is not every company. It's only like the top 10% of the asset class that's kind of making it into the portfolio. And we do this in a very data-driven way. Um, so number one, we've got financial performance data on roughly 75% of VC back companies. And in a market environment like the current one, uh, it is crucial to know how well companies are doing as it relates to financial performance, because most founders don't want to raise money while the markets suck. And if you don't want to raise money while the markets suck, then you need to be able to make it through the next two years without having to raise money. And so financial performance gives us visibility to that. We also have visibility into a company's financing trajectory. So in other words, are they raising progressive up rounds on a decent cadence or did they just raise a flat round after four years? Um, we have perfect visibility into that company's financing terms. So are they offering off-market terms like participating preferred high liquidation preference multiples, huge cumulative dividends or not? Uh, we have a sense for the investors that are behind those companies and whether they're blue chip investors or not. We also have excellent visibility into the employee flows to and from the company. So uh, company just hires its first CFO, great signal. They hire their first sales team, great signal. They lay off 50% of the workforce, terrible signal. <laughs> um, and, and a number of other kind of uh, signal sets that we can get into. But that's that's the basis upon which we decide which few thousand companies we love out of the overall universe and therefore how we manage our risk during times like this. Fascinating, yes, fascinating. Avoid risk as much as we can. 
So diversification does a lot of work too. What's that? I said diversification does a lot of work too. Yes, for sure, it's key. So, I mean, this is a very vast space, the alternative space. I would love to know more about your journey and how you even, you know, came into this space in the first place. Uh, I would say it's more through the side door than anything else. So I, I do have a hedge fund background, as we discussed. And so there's a, there's a little bit of an argument that I have an asset management background, but um, mostly I've been an entrepreneur for the last 12 years. Uh, starting and failing, starting and succeeding, seeing companies, you know, go from zero to one a couple of times. And I have an entrepreneur. <laughs> yeah, no, for sure. Um, definitely didn't do everything perfectly on the way to where we are now. Um, so I've, I've seen a lot of ups and downs and I have a, a pretty deep well of empathy for the VC asset class and the founders and the employees that are participating in it. So when it turned out that we had an opportunity to participate in it. I, I was actually pretty excited. It's it's neat to have a product that is helping startup employees with a huge problem. And just to put numbers around the employee side of things, um, roughly 50% of in the money stock options uh, go abandoned by employees because they can't find the money that they need. And we're talking like hundreds of billions of dollars worth of this stuff over the course of 10 years. So this is like a legitimately big problem that you almost need to have worked in this world to know and appreciate. Uh, and then on the other side, we get to make a, a VC fund product. And we can, uh, like I, as a human being, get to skip the line as an asset manager and go from working at a hedge fund in my past life to actually running a fund uh, in my current life without having stopped in between uh, too many times. So I, I'm actually pretty excited about it. It's amazing. It's amazing what you've accomplished too over your, your career and uh, how diverse your career has been too, you know? Uh, mostly I can attribute that to me figuring out what I didn't want to do in my 20s. <laughs> the, the, the career arc has been meandering and it has not been meandering on purpose. I just finally landed in the place that I liked, which was entrepreneurship. Awesome. So, well, bottom line, when it comes to alts, I mean, they're, they have a reputation for being, you know, complicated. Why do you think that is? There's no price transparency for the most part, depending on what asset class you're talking about within the very large wor world of alternatives. And also they're extremely illiquid. So you kind of, you need to figure out what they could be worth. And then you need to be ready to patiently wait to see whether you're right. And both of those things kind of suck. So it's it's not that it's not that they're incredibly complicated. Uh, like private equities and public equities would be assessed similarly if all the information was available for both. But you actually have all the information for public equities, whereas you almost have nothing for private for the private markets. And so it's it it feels much more opaque from the outside. I heard you say earlier that alts, uh, you know, that you do serve high net worth investors. So. So you're saying that is a good option, that they are a good option for high net worth investors. I mean, I think less, I would say less categorically than that. So not everybody should be dabbling uh, in heavily liquid asset classes. So for example, if you don't have uh, a decent amount of discretionary investment capital, then it's kind of, it's a little bit scary. You might not want to be tied up for the average 10 year life cycle of a VC fund. Um, if you do have enough capital that you can put some of it to the side and not think about it for a while, then for sure, because it's uh, the various alternative asset classes have proven themselves to be significantly less correlated to stocks and bonds, which is what the traditional portfolio has been made of historically. And uh, that's especially important since especially in the last couple of years, stocks and bonds turned out to be correlated in a couple instances. So uh, it's a great place to be if you can comfortably be there. I've also heard you say in interviews in the past that you would guess the percentages of people that, you know, could access alternative investments versus those that actually do access alternative investments, they just don't line up. So what do you feel is holding people back uh, if they do have access? I think a couple things. One I touched on earlier, which is just risk tolerance. So like VC, as an example, um, VC fund managers have huge dispersion in their returns. You do not want to be 
uh, accidentally in the bottom quartile of VC fund managers having invested in your local VC and not appreciated that that's where they would end up. Um, and there's a lot of randomness to it as well. So risk tolerance is for sure one. Um, I think there's a whole other set of complications that relate more to financial advisors who might manage money that could go into VC. And it's just private assets are tough. Like you've got 100 page sub docs to get through and a ton of reporting to do that. Like if you end up in multiple different private asset managers and you get reports from each one, you've got to consolidate them for your clients. Uh, ever since Bernie Madoff, custodians have been very important. And so you need to get like onboarded as a fund manager onto the various custodians that are used by the various financial advisors. And that's not something that everybody's got muscle memory with. So I think separate from risk tolerance on the investor side, there's also just administrative ease on the uh, financial advisor side. Is there, in reality, is there anyone that doesn't have access or is that just a misconception? No, there's still plenty of people that don't have access to various asset classes. So like minimums, uh, minimums will preclude uh, what are commonly called the mass affluent and also the accredited investor set from accessing some of the funds. Uh, we're trying our best in our own fund. In our prior fund, we had a $250,000 minimum, which is great because it's less than 10 million. Uh, but it's also not great because it's a lot more than a hundred thousand. Uh, and so I think, I think there's still a long way to go in terms of truly democratizing access, access to all these various, uh, alternative asset classes. And how would you, I mean, how would, could we go about it? How do we make them more accessible? Uh, one way that we're going to be checking out over the next bit is to, uh, register your fund. Um, and registration takes away a lot of the, uh, it introduces a number of other uh, regulatory and administrative headaches, but it also takes away the minimum ticket size uh, issue, as an example. Mm -hmm. So, and why don't we talk about some trends? You know, what would you say are the emerging trends that you're seeing in this space? There are a number of trends that were uh, slowed down by the financial markets uh, ending <laughs> in May, May and June of last year. But I've seen a huge push on the investor side into the alternative asset classes. They're getting a ton more airtime than they used to. Um, and as I've kind of learned it, a lot of that is uh, driven by the ultimate investor set rather than the financial advisors. I think financial advisors don't necessarily have a lot of incentive other than client retention to be the first to jump into an alternative asset class. Uh, but the investors have been, the ones who didn't want to get into crypto wanted to get into VC, and the ones who didn't want to get into VC wanted to get into private equity and then private credit and real estate. And so there's been a bunch of demand on the side of the investor base to uh, open up alts. Um, I will also say that on the private company, private shares liquidity side, there has been a, a significant trend arrested a little bit starting last year, but I think it's the train has left the station on this, which is um, liquidity around private shares. So uh, startup employees, usually you do, you uh, work in a startup for a number of different reasons, not all of which are our money, uh, you like the uh, ability to contribute to something meaningfully at an early stage, and you don't like having bosses and uh, a whole bunch of psychological and personality characteristic things, but also uh, you get stock options. And if you happen to work at Facebook, you are done working for the rest of your life. And that's a meaningful incentive, um, except that your stock options are usually only worth something on paper for the better part of like six to 12 years. And that kind of sucks because you're kind of eating ramen noodles and crashing on your friend's couch. And uh, when you're in your 20s, you can do that. And when you get a little bit older, you can't anymore, which sucks. So the uh, trend towards creating some amount of liquidity around your private shares before there's a corporate level liquidity event, like an IPO or an acquisition, uh, is a really clear trend. And I think it's slowed in the last year only because financial markets have forced it to slow, but I think it's going to go straight up into the right again as, as markets come back. That's, that is great advice. Would you say, well, what would be, I, I would like to know, what are your tips really are for learning more about this space? Because, you know, I'm, my listeners and myself, this is a, a whole new 
uh, you know, platform and, and we're all, you know, just about finding the best tools and tips and educational access to really fully understand uh, the alternative space. What would yeah. be favorite, um, you know, alt resources? So on the investor side, I actually have liked a number of the podcasts that I've come across in the last year. Or so the alternatives, Mason, as an example, but um, Meb Faber's podcast and uh, and Andy Hagen's podcast, which is uh, the alternative investing podcast. Um, I also like a bunch of the resources that are put out by some of the shops that are providing the plumbing for the alternatives universe. Uh, so iCapital and Case uh, are, are a couple ones that have put out a bunch of good literature to help both their users who are primarily financial advisors and the ultimate clients who are the investors uh, learn a significant amount about um, private equity, VC, well, less VC, but private equity, real estate, private credit, uh, and a handful of other alts categories. On the employee side, um, I think utilities like Vested provide a decent amount of content on how to think about your stock and your stock options. Uh, and we've got some of the shops that I mentioned focusing on the uh, later stage companies and the senior employees also provide a great amount of content. So uh, Quid and SecFi and ESO Fund and Liquid Stock are uh, good sources of content. Well, thank you. I am going to look into all of those. Is there anything else you would like to add? Anything else you'd like to add before we, we wrap it up? Anything else I'd like to add? Um, I am curious, I guess, on uh, what you've seen in your first couple episodes of kind of opening up the alts world. So what are you guys planning on getting into? Is it uh, asset classes? Is it the administrative side of things? Is it investor psychology? Like, how are you thinking about things? Oh my goodness. Well, there's a, a variety of things that I'm personally interested in with this. I mean, definitely behavioral, um, the psychological aspect of, of a lot of this for sure. Um, and I mean, I'm just a sponge right now learning everything I possibly can. I just finished the, um, the Unify by Kaya, uh, the fundamentals of alternatives. I just finished that. So that um that was really informative and i'm just like a sponge right now taking all the information in that i that i possibly can about this this space all right. um there's no on the first couple episodes i talked a little bit about you know what i was doing before this very very different i was more in marketing and advertising working in you know fashion and entertainment so um, you know, went from the fashion industry over to finance. So very different, but I'm loving this world and, and learning, um, you know, all about it. And the alternative space is one that is very exciting because it's growing and, you know, it it's pretty large and it, you know, and it seems, um, you know, there's a lot of attention moving in that direction. So for sure. Yeah. So you, you just made me think of something. Uh, Come back to me later and let me know uh, what you think about the following. So, oh, I'm sorry, what was that? What you think about the following? So, behavioral, uh, how how investors react uh, to the ups and downs of the stock market is really interesting to me. And I kind of think from the perspective of illiquid uh, investments, like al most alternatives are, that that may be a feature rather than a bug. So like you see a bunch of people uh, when stock markets move up a little bit and down a little bit, go absolutely bananas and sell too much or buy too much. And it's kind of nice in the liquid universe where you don't have prices that are moving up and down constantly in terms of getting people to chill out and remember the what the point of the liquid asset is in the first place. So uh, mm -hmm. as you come up your own curve, uh, let me know if you end up agreeing or disagreeing with that. I will. I will let you know. I really appreciate it. This is this has been very informative for me and and our listeners. So again, thank you so much for taking the time, you know, to chat with us for a little bit about this space. And I'm definitely going to, you know, take uh, all the advice that you've given, you know, and and look more into um, those resources. So thank you so much. Awesome. And 
listening. Thank you so much for listening. Be sure to follow us on all of our you know, social networks, Twitter, LinkedIn, and Instagram, Banner and Capital. Thanks so much for tuning in and we will see you on the next episode where we will dissect alt knowledge brick by brick right here from the Green House. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Bye. Thanks, Bye. The opinions expressed in this program are for general informational purposes only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual or any specific security. It is only intended to provide education about the financial industry. To determine which investments may be appropriate for you, consult your financial advisor prior to investing. Any past performance discussed during this program is no guarantee of future results. Any indices referenced for comparisons are unmanaged and cannot be invested into directly. As always, please remember, investing involves risk and possible loss of capital. Please seek advice from a licensed professional.